Yeah. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Um, I do see a lot of familiar names, but also some some new names. So for those of you who might be new to the Harris Center, uh, Harris Center for Conservation Education is bringing you tonight's program where a nonprofit land trust and environmental education center based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire, where we help people fall in love with the natural world. We do that through land protection. We've protected more than 25,000 acres of land from development now. Much of that is open for hiking and birding and other recreation um, if you're living locally. We also coordinate conservation research on our lands and throughout the region, including some really fun community science projects and a whole bunch of bird related research. Um, Bill Brown is here with us tonight. and He's our bird conservation director. He'll be helping to um, facilitate the Q&A towards the end of the evening. And then really at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages, from babies in backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. We have an incredible calendar of events for the general public. And with that, um, it's really my honor tonight to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Lauren Farr. She's an avian ecologist and a PhD student. She's pursuing her degree in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology at North Carolina State, NC State. Her current research focuses on the effects of climate change on nestling success in the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. She earned her bachelor's in environmental biology from Wingate University in 2019 and her master's in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology from, um, do you say NC State? Is that how you got what you guys say in North Carolina? Yeah. Okay. Um, Northerner here. Um, so in addition to her research, Lauren's an engaged science communicator and a contributing editor for North Carolina Sea Grant. She's also a member of the Wildlife Society's editorial advisory board and an advocate for Black and historically excluded minorities in STEM. She lives in Raleigh, and we're really excited to learn from her tonight. So with that, um, take it away, Lauren. Thank you so much for that introduction. Two things. One, I'm going to have to check out that Bark book because, oh my gosh, that is an accomplishment. <laughs> my face was like, oh. And two, you said red cockaded woodpecker perfectly. There's so many people who are like, is that, do I say cockaded? Is it cock cockaded? Like, I, so you said it perfectly on the first try, congrats. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Again, thank you so much for coming out this evening. And I wanna say a big thanks to the Harris Center for having me as well. Uh, tonight, I will be giving a talk on the effects of urbanization on wild bird species. So as said in my introduction, I have since moved away from my noise and light pollution urbanization work and have now focused on endangered species with the red cockaded woodpeckers. However, I do love to come back and dabble in talking about noise and light pollution effects and urbanization in general. Uh, so um, with this, I was also telling folks at the beginning that I'm super excited because this will be, I've given this presentation many times, but this has, this will be my first time actually presenting the results from my master's work that's officially published. So I'm super excited about that. So I can come to you with some real results now instead of preliminary data. <laughs> so, um, so with that being said, throughout this presentation, towards the end, uh, with a few slides, we'll have what we call QR codes. So if if you are not familiar with that, basically it's going to be a code that you can take um, your phone camera and hold it up there and scan it and it will bring you bring you to a link. I also have a link, a little short link that you can type in to, um, to see the referenced work that I'm talking about. But towards the end, I have a QR code with another link that will give you a list of resources, everything from the projects and research papers that I referenced to more resources if you want to learn more about noise and light pollution from my other colleagues um, and urbanization effects that will be there as well. But I'm sure the Hair Center can um, share that all with you along with my contact information. So with that being said, all that housekeeping, all of my housekeeping is done now. I will move right into it. So, all right. So I love to have a, a slide about kind of what, you know, you will learn throughout my presentation, what you will have learned by the end of it. So by the end of this presentation, we're going to cover a lot of things. So you will have been introduced to common urbanization effects, as well as introduced to noise and light pollution as a whole. So the scientist in me really loves to go over and cover 
uh, everything that's, you know, under or the umbrella itself before we get into more specifics when talking about birds, which is what we're going to be talking about today. But I really love to touch on the common urbanization effects first and then talk a little bit about noise and light pollution, how that impacts various um, animals and ecosystems, etc. Then we'll move deeper into talking about noise and light pollution and its effects on bird species. So really, really focusing on birds, which is what you came to learn about this evening. And then we'll move into a little bit talking about my study, um, looking at, you know, these various urbanization effects on avian survival, which is what my master's thesis was on. And then towards the end, we will talk about some um, ways that you as an individual can help when it comes to these urbanization effects, specifically light pollution, because I found that it's really easy for us to really uh, help with when it comes to light pollution compared to noise pollution. Um, and then we'll also, I'll leave you all with those resources that I referenced there at the beginning. So with that being said, we'll move right into it. So I am sure you all have heard or are familiar with this term urbanization, right? So uh, I was talking earlier, I take my area in Raleigh as a prime example. So Raleigh, North Carolina is where North Carolina State University is. We are right in the heart of an urban area. So we have tons of buildings, we have you know tons of traffic, tons of light pollution, tons of noise pollution. So really that is our example there of what we're calling an urban area. And this is just continuing to increase, you know, throughout the years. So I really love to use this photo because uh, it really, really hits home very well. So in this photo, we have a witch and we have her candy house and she's talking to her neighbor and she simply says, I remember when this was all forest. So we see that around her here, you know, we have a guy that's mowing his lawn we have you know houses everywhere that have that have you know been there we have the birds that are in the sky there um if you see a few birds there but really we're seeing urbanization firsthand and what we think about when it comes to this term urbanization right so urbanization uh defined as the population shift from rural to urban areas is projected to increase by more than 3 billion people between the years of 2010 and 2050 so i'm sure probably where you are and again probably where i am throughout <laughs> throughout this world urbanization is doing just that and it's continuing to increase with with the number of homes being built and everything like that i bring up the story of my nieces and nephews. They are really, really young, but it's just so amazing what kids know. So they already know and can put two and two together that as they're driving, you know, with their parents on, on the road and they're looking out the windows, right? And they see that there's deer on the side of the road, like standing there trying to cross the road and everything. They will literally say like, oh, like what happened to the deer's homes? Like the deer don't have homes anymore. And so like literally it's, it's just, it's just the way that, you know, we think about it when it comes to urbanization and how we're looking at how it impacts, you know, our various, you know, ecosystems and animal species. And so we also have this term here, anthropogenic. And so really, this is really talking about things that are originating in human activity, right? And so we have anthro, you know, which, which means human there, that, that, that root there. But, um, Really, if you hear something that has anthropogenic in front of it, you can think of it being like human activity, human made, human driven. So you might hear terms like anthropogenic light or anthropogenic noise. That is simply another term for saying noise and light pollution, but um, putting that anthropogenic in front of it is really driving home the fact that we are one of the big contributing factors, if not the most contributing factors of noise and light pollution there. Before we get more uh, simplified in talking about birds and the impacts of urbanization, noise and light pollution on them, I really like to take a step back and really think about how urbanization is impacting various animal species. So I gave the example with my with my nieces and nephews with the deer, right? So we're seeing all these houses pop up. We're seeing forests, you know, getting mowed down for these houses. So we're, we're having a lack of forests. And I use deer as an example because there's a lot of deer. <laughs> the population of deer is really, really huge. Uh, but, you know, the, the more forests that they're losing, the, the more that or the, the less that they have to, you know, to, to raise they're young to bed. I mean, deer bed in mature forest and we're cutting that down in order to, you know, build our housing and our structures and everything like that. And so, you know, they use to forage in, I mean, everything and not just deer, but other animals. Um, so lack of forest is a, a result of this, of this urbanization effect that we're seeing. 
Another example is vehicle fatalities. So I use turtles as an example. So just think about, you know, putting a road right smack dab in the middle of your home. And that's exactly what leads to vehicle fatalities. So something that we call habitat fragmentation. So we, we have a road or we have a structure that's like right smack dab in the middle of your home and it cuts off connectivity with that environment, right? So we see a lot of turtles now that have to risk their lives literally to cross the road to get from one side to another due to this habitat fragmentation and these this increased roads and impervious surface. Uh, fun fact that if you ever see a turtle that is crossing the road and you are able to safely help it, um, make sure that you always take that turtle and take it in the direction that it was going, not the direction that it was coming from in order to help it cross the street. If you can safely do it. I will put that disclaimer there. Um, the next thing here is supplemental feeding. So I know that Hopefully for most of us, we don't intentionally want to feed the wildlife <laughs> when, when we're in our urban areas, but because of the increase of human activity, we have more things, you know, like food and like things that are being put into trash cans, right? And, you know, um, not, you know, secure, not securing our trash, people leaving their pet food out. This can attract animals like raccoons. And this could basically not end well for the raccoons or, you know, people wanting to get rid of the raccoons. I mean, so it's putting animals like raccoons at risk simply because of our practices that we're doing in urban areas that can simply be avoided. So securely disposing of our trash, disposing of our pet food, this can really decrease Increase that, but because of humans and and our numbers, you know, continuing to increase in these areas, we're going to see a lot of this continuing to happen as well. And then last but not least, we have pesticides. So I'm sure, like some people, you know, with their homes, they have nice, pretty flowers. They want to keep them pretty. They want to get rid of bugs. Um, same thing with you know um, companies or you know landscaping, you know, where they have their flowers and they want to treat the flowers. Uh, Pesticides and the amount that we're using, I mean, that goes hand in hand because what we have to think about here is when we're talking about pesticides, we have to really think about how that is impacting that ecosystem that relies on those insects, right? So if we're talking about birds, birds rely heavily on insects. And so those pesticides are impacting those insects, whether that be, you know, um, you know, poison like from the from the insects when the birds digest it to just getting rid of a good number of insects and birds not having that food source there to rely on. So we really have to think about if there are other ways that we can, you know, treat things when it comes to getting rid of insects or things to do that's very like ethically, you know, safe, especially for our environment, and especially for the animals who might be consuming those things that we're trying to treat. So that was an overview of urbanization as a whole and how it impacts, how it can impact specific species. Again, it is not limited to those species examples. Those are just the most common ones that I think of that people can relate to really, really easily because we, we see it, right? So now we're specifically gonna move into anthropogenic noise and light pollution. So you may hear light pollution be um, referred to in different ways. Ways So we have you know anthropogenic light, we have um, artificial night at light, so ALAN, A-L-A-N, as the acronym, basically simply put still means light pollution. So if you ever hear those terms, just know that it is still talking about light pollution. So in general, when we are talking about anthropogenic noise and artificial light and how it can impact animal species, so we're working our way under this umbrella, how it can impact various animal species. We're talking from species in the ocean to species in the forest, um, various ways that it can impact these species. Things such as, you know, chronic stress, such as foraging, migration, growth and development, communication, all of this has been researched with various animal species from whales to birds to, you know, you name it, it's been researched. Chickens, <laughs> birds, you name it, it's been researched. Um, and this research has found that these various things due to anthropogenic noise and light pollution have caused you know these these ecosystems and these animals to be impacted and various various um you know uh what word am i looking for here like various like various things in their lives that have been impacted with stress and like their migration patterns and their foraging their behaviors really is what i'm looking for here and how noise and light can impact those behaviors of animal species so taking all that into consideration here Birds experience these things too. So that's what you all came to hear about this evening. But again, 
I hope that that overview of urbanization and that urbanization umbrella, how it impacts, you know, various animal species, then working our way to noise and light pollution, and then now to birds, it's going to make it a little bit more clear as we go through these examples of bird species. So birds experience these same things too when it comes to uh, noise and light pollution. So I will first focus on noise pollution. I will say that while I was doing my studies with this, there was there was not that much noise pollution studies as there were light studies. I feel that, you know, light studies are probably a little bit, I say easier, but like, you know, a little bit, we can get a little bit more out of light pollution studies with how we approach it um, compared to noise pollution. Like we can measure decibels and various things like that. But um, when it came to birds and me doing the research that I did, I didn't really find a lot of, uh, various noise pollution things. There was a lot of things that we're talking about, you know, different things like their fight or flight response, their communication is, is another thing, reproduction and circadian rhythms. Those were the common themes that I saw and really nothing outside of that. So it really didn't um, lead to more <laughs> research um, findings, if you will. But taking all these things into consideration, so we have how noise pollution can impact bird species, right? So we have, for one thing, their fight or flight response. If there's areas that are loud, what are birds going to do? Hopefully, most likely, they will they will leave and it will trigger their flight or flight response. Some might put up with it, but initially, this will trigger their flight or flight response. Uh, reproduction. So reproduction and communication, really, they both go hand in hand here. And what I mean by this is that with noise pollution, right, we know that there's a lot of bird species who communicate um, it, in, in regards to, you know, finding mates and, you know, to, to have eggs and nestlings. And so you can really think about if there's noise pollution that's impacting that birds, some birds may not be so successful, or there has been in some studies where some birds have learned to adapt to this and change their um, vocalizations, which we will get into as an example that I wanted to pull to introduce to you all. But the two that I will focus on today are circadian rhythms and communication. So for the circadian rhythms, right, just think about our circadian rhythm. Everything has a circadian rhythm. So our circadian rhythm is a natural internal process that regulates our sleep-wake cycle. So Again, as we have a circadian rhythm and how it can get interrupted, how it can get easily interrupted for birds, it's the exact same thing. So for birds and for other animals, this serves as an environmental cue. So it serves, you know, for, you know, letting birds know when they wake up to when they go to forage to when they go to sleep. And so if noise pollution is impacting that, you can see how these behaviors of these birds might be off, off uh, altered and that their circadian rhythms will um, then be impacted by that. And then we'll get a little bit into communication. So what I was referring to when talking about communication and reproduction going hand in hand. So birds singing, birds singing, you know, just to sing, birds singing um, for alert calls, birds singing to find mates, noise pollution is impacting all of those things. So the one example that I wanted to pull, and it's a really common example, again, when we're looking at noise pollution and birds in particular, we are looking at how noise impacts bird song and specifically, again, anthropogenic noise. So in this study, bird song and anthropogenic noise, vocal constraints may explain why birds sing higher frequency songs in cities. So this study specifically looked at common blackbirds. And we see here that we have two areas. So we have our forested area here, which is represented by this green line. And we have the city area here, which is represented by the blue line. So as we see, as we get a little bit into like 2.3, 2.5 frequency here, we see that this blue line is a little bit higher and is overpowering this green line. So again, this blue line is the city. And so we see here starting out that the birds in the forest were singing higher than the birds in the city. I mean, that makes sense. But then now we get into the city portion here and we're seeing that birds are being able to manipulate their sounds and their vocals in order to continue to make progress when it comes to communication and finding mates and various things like that. And so these common blackbirds in cities, again, they found that they vocalize with a higher frequency and amplitude than blackbirds in these forested areas. And so basically by singing at higher frequencies, these common blackbirds in the city reduce their acoustic masking by low frequency traffic noise. Basically all this means in layman's terms is that the 
birds over time found a way to adapt to those noises in the city and therefore um, alter their vocalizations. And again, if you, you know, go on Google Scholar or Google it, this is probably one of the top studies that have been studied when it comes to noise pollution and when it comes to birds. And one thing that I want to mention here as we continue to move on into birds, birds are what we call a keystone species. So basically what we mean by keystone species is that birds can tell us a lot of things when it comes to our environment. And if we see how something is impacting birds, we can then eventually see how we can hopefully work to a solution to where it can really benefit this entire ecosystem and not impact the ecosystem as a whole. So if it's impacting birds, we're assuming that it's impacting that ecosystem as well. So birds serve as a major keystone species as well as other animals. So these, all of these studies, when it comes to noise pollution, when it comes to light pollution, studying birds is therefore helping these other species of animals in these ecosystems as well. So now let's move on to light pollution. So light pollution is probably, again, the one that I, at least I found when I was doing my research and my study that it was, there was a lot, <laughs> there was a lot on light pollution and birds, right? So uh, the various things here, again, light pollution impacting circadian rhythms, growth and development was another one. So there was research, which I have pulled one out here that I will actually show as an example. There was some research done and my colleague uh, that was at NC State, she did some similar research as well, looking at the impacts of light pollution on growth and development of nestlings. So she specifically looked at barn swallows. So there have been many studies that have shown that light pollution has impacted growth and development of nestlings and that nestlings in a, in a rural area didn't show the same effects as nestlings in an urban area. So those various things we are seeing with light pollution. Chronic stress, so that's another one. The same with noise pollution, chronic stress and light pollution can cause that factor as well. Foraging, so light pollution having an impact on um, birds foraging, when they forage, how they forage. But I want to, I want you to keep in mind though that Sometimes light pollution might can work to an advantage for some species, and we'll get into that. So I, I want you to keep that in mind of what species, of what bird species that might be. Um, but then another thing too with reproduction and migration. So the two that I'm going to focus on here are definitely going to be migration and growth and development. So when we're talking about migration, this is probably the one that you all have heard about the most and have seen common examples. So we're talking about things like getting into window strikes and window collisions. Uh, light pollution messing up, you know, birds, you know, as they're flying and, you know, orienteering and various things like that. So you have probably heard migration the most out of all of these. Um, but we'll also hit on growth and development as well, because I found myself that looking at light pollution effects on growth and development in birds was really, really interesting and something that I hadn't thought about. But then once you kind of think about it, you're like, oh, well, that kind of makes that kind of makes sense there. Um, so this study here in 2015, so they looked at some sparrows in two different areas. So the two things that they looked at with these sparrows were their body mass and their tarsus length, right? And then we also have these areas. So the blue areas are representing our rural areas and the yellow areas are representing our urban areas. So they looked at these areas and they wanted to see were sparrows were, was their growth and development different compared to these urban and rural areas? And sure enough, they found that there was a difference. So again, our urban areas in yellow, they saw that in these more urbanized habitats um, that, you know, these sparrows had a reduced body size as well as tarsus length compared to the sparrows that were in the rural areas. And so they had a few, um, a few kind of why they thought this was kind of, you know, things to this. So for one thing, along with this, they found that there was a significant difference in juvenile fat scores. So basically, you know, how big the sparrows were getting and the nutrients that they were getting and everything like that. And they basically determined that these, that the nutrients that were in the urban areas 
weren't the same as the nutrients that these sparrows would or could be getting in the rural areas. So this could totally be um, a, a reason for this finding in this study. And now, so I also want to bring it back to the fact that this gets into what we call our generalist and our specialist species. So especially when it comes to birds, our generalist species are the species that are more um, likely and more able to adapt to the environment that they're in. So we can think about those species like uh, Northern Cardinals or American Robins. There's a lot of those species that we see in those urban areas, right? So we see a lot of Robins, we see a lot of Cardinals. We also see a lot of Sparrows nowadays, but I noted that the study was in 2015. So there could have been, you know, a little bit of difference in looking at Sparrows way back then and looking at their food resources. But at least for me, I do see a lot of Sparrows and that's telling me that those Sparrows are, um, have become or, you know, adapted to these urban areas. So basically with these generalist species, they are able to adapt to these areas. They're able to find food that's adequate for them. They're able to find nesting habitat that's adequate for them, right? Compared to what we call our specialist species. So let's take a specialist species like the red cockaded woodpecker, for example. So this species is endemic to the longleaf pine ecosystem, meaning that they thrive and therefore, you know, have to stay in the longleaf pine ecosystem for the benefits that they receive in that ecosystem, right? So you would not see a red cockaded woodpecker in urban areas. I, I get photos and emails all the time from people and they're like, oh, I think I saw a red cockaded woodpecker today at my feeder. And it turns out that it was a downy woodpecker or a hairy woodpecker because they look very, very similar. So I will give people that, but I will say nine times out of 10, you will never find an RCW in an urban area unless that area is very, very close to a longleaf pine ecosystem and they're just flying over, you know, or, you know, just, yeah, like as a, as a flyover habitat or something, but never there to forage or to, um, or to make their nest, right? So this study uh, in particular here, again, they found that sparrows in more urbanized habitats had reduced body size and body mass compared to the sparrows in rural areas. And again, the juveniles, they found that their fat scores were significantly different between the urban areas and the rural areas. So again, this is the one that you all are probably more familiar with or may have heard more about. So if you have heard a lot of things about like the lights out campaigns or various things like that, that all has to do with looking at light pollution and light installation and its impacts on um, bird species and bird migration, window collisions, building collisions, et cetera. That is, that is what that's for. So this study here, which was done in 2017, it is looking at a study that was done using the September 11th, so 9-11 Memorial in New York. And basically it was simple. They saw that when these lights were illuminated, these beaming lights were illuminated, the birds, you know, there that they saw when these lights were illuminated, this resulted in these birds being really, really stressed. Uh, they were aggregated, especially at high densities. They decreased their flight speed. They circled kind of like they didn't know where they were going or, you know, they couldn't see. And they also increased their vocalizations, right? And so really, really looking at this again, it, it really gets into that conversation that many people have started to have and they're continuing to have. And I absolutely love, you know, hearing about it when it is happening and, you know, ever so often being a part of those conversations. But it gets into those conversations about how we can help the birds when it comes to light pollution and when it comes to them, you know, during migration season. Because the thing about birds is that they actually use landmarks in order to navigate themselves. And one of those landmarks is actually they can use the stars in the sky um, to orient themselves and like, you know, and figure out the direction that they need to go. And so one of those things that impacts that is something that we call sky glow. And this will make more sense when I get into the solutions of like what we can do as individuals. But um, sky glow basically is, is, um, is something that results in, you know, all of these bright lights <laughs> that are basically impacting the sky or, or pointing up to the sky. So we have, you know, these illuminated buildings, illuminated billboards, light fixtures that are facing upwards when they should be facing downwards. And again, that'll make, this will make sense when I get into the solutions here. But 
you know, really thinking, you know, about that and how light pollution is impacting bird species as they migrate has become a really, really big conversation that people continue to have, especially when it comes to migration season, right? So this, I definitely wanted to throw this in here because this actually happened this year. I, I'm sure, or I hope that you might've heard about it. Uh, a, a ton of news sources covered it. Cornell, Autobahn. Uh, I just pulled this from actually a, a university uh, website that I saw because it was the first one that I found because I couldn't find the original, but it's still the same thing. Um, so basically in Chicago, Illinois, on October 4th and 5th, there was this major bird window collision strike. And yes, all of the birds that you see here, and there was more, this is just the cover photo, were impacted uh, by bird window collision strikes as they were migrating due to various things, high intensity migration, adverse weather, and light and glass. And so, of course, there's nothing really that we can do to control the weather, but we can definitely control the lights. And so that's why this conversation is really important for people to continue to have when it comes to ways that we can help with light pollution and specifically when it comes to helping our bird friends, right? So within Chicago, Illinois, these came from eBird lists, these numbers that people submitted. One observer um, observed 134,000 birds passing in just one hour. In one hour, just think about that, like that's a lot of birds. Another observer observed 120,000 warblers in northern Chicago, right? And there's no doubt that some of those birds were the victims of this major bird window collision. So again, it's just something that we continue to think about and have conversations about and just work on ways that we can do our part in working on light pollution and decreasing that as a whole. And so now I'll get into my project and my research that I did looking at both noise and light pollution. So again, this is our first QR code. So if you have your phone, if you open up your phone's camera, point it to this QR code, it will take you to a link that links right to this um, this article if you want to read it for yourself. But if you don't have access to your phone's camera, you can also type in that link there, the go.ncsu link, and it'll take you right to it as well. So my project used citizen science data in order to investigate the effects of urbanization on non-migratory avian survival rates. So a lot of these projects we see are looking at migratory birds, right? Because we're looking at migration and impact of noise and light, like self-explanatory, right? But we wanted to do one that was focused on non-migratory birds. So that's where my project here comes in. The term citizen science, you may have heard it thrown around with community science. So basically what both of these terms basically mean is that we have everyday individuals who are helping to contribute to scientific projects. So basically we have individuals who are helping, you know, top-notch researchers contribute to the data that then goes into the data analyzation that then goes into papers such as this. We as scientists or just people in general, we can't be in, you know, two places at the same time, right? So especially when it comes to data that may be, you know, being collected in a certain, you know, area or a certain state, right? So we have volunteers who will sign up and who will help us collect certain data. So for this data in particular with this project, they did point count surveys. So basically um, point count surveys, reciting birds because these birds have what we call color bands on them. So they were banded with a unique color band that people could then recite and say, oh, like this is that bird, you know, etc." cetera. So that's really what, um, that's really the, the use of citizen community science projects and why I love them so much because not only can, you know, everyday people contribute to science, but this can also empower them and get them really excited about why, you know, work that scientists and researchers are doing are important. And then it dives deeper into maybe, you know, community, um, community, uh, you know, concerns that they have. So one is like, you know, lead in, in water, right? Or like flooding, getting community members involved in certain, you know, aspects of science that they're really passionate about because it's impacting their, their communities is another way that citizen science, community science can be used to that advantage. So this project in particular, we, um, so I, I use data from the Citizen Science Project Neighborhood Nest Watch. So it is a citizen science project that is out of the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. So this project specifically is used to determine the influence of human built environments on bird populations. 
And so with this project, it there's been numerous publications that have come out of it looking at various things. One with my collaborator on here, um, Brian Evans, he looked at things like impervious surface. So looking at the effects of sidewalks or roads on, on avian survival, right? So I wanted to specifically look at noise and light pollution because again, it's it's one of the things that in the bird world keeps getting researched and keeps getting talked about because it's really important. So, but I wanted to see that specifically on those non-migratory species. So the species that just really don't migrate, right? So the species that I looked at were seven different uh, focal species. So those species included gray catbirds, Northern Cardinals, House Wrens, Carolina Wrens, Song Sparrows, Carolina Chickadees, and American Robins. So those were our common focal species there that we use throughout this project. The map, the figure that you see here, so this is what we call an inset map, and these are correlations of that neighborhood nest watch program in the greater Washington DC area. And so basically what we did here was we took that area and we did some, we did some magic, I like to call it, an ArcGIS, and we basically came up with these maps that show it, that showed us noise and light pollution levels of the greater Washington DC area. And then that gave us our noise, you know, decibels, it gave us light levels, everything like that. So that was kind of our baseline data to get to use to get to analyze our results for these various species when it comes to their survival and things like that. So the re the results, which I'm like super excited to talk about now that I can finally talk about it because it's published. Um, so out of those seven species, we actually found that light pollution severely impacted only three of them. So the three species that we found were American robins, gray catbirds, and house wrens. So we see that American robins appeared to actually benefit from lights. So if we see over here um, at our annual apparent survival uh, figures over here, it's increasing, right? But we see here that gray catbirds and house wrens, their annual survival is decreasing when it comes to light pollution. So American robins, again, we saw that they appeared to benefit from city lights. So we were not surprised by this result because there have been many studies that have shown and determined that robins actually use light to their advantage. What they'll do is they will start to sing earlier and they will start to basically be active much earlier <laughs> because of the lights. Um, but this works into their benefit because it gives them more time to um, forage or increase the amount of time that they have to forage or find mates, etc. So that finding wasn't really uh, surprising to us there. When it came to the gray catbirds, there were some studies here that we found that they were actually that they're actually one of the species that are more more vulnerable to window collisions. And with house wrens, we saw that this this species they sometimes migrate to states that are a little farther south, though not into Central or South America like so called long distance migrants, right? So with both of the gray catbirds and the house wrens. Migration related behaviors seem to make these species more vulnerable when it came to light pollution. So that was light pollution. We actually found no links with these seven different species that we use to noise pollution. And we found that to be a little surprising uh, because again, there have been, you know, the studies that I have mentioned and the studies that I have, you know, read about there, there's been a lot, although there's been few studies, there's been a lot that they found to where noise pollution has impacted bird species. So it was somewhat of a surprise because these studies have shown various things like noise pollution causing increased amounts of stress and, uh, you know, having an impact on their health. And so health, we have figured, oh, well, there's going to be some kind of result when it comes to uh, avian species and um, noise pollution and their survival, right? But we actually did not find any significant results to noise pollution like we found with these three species and light pollution, which goes on to say that it, there needs to be more studies and especially more in-depth studies when it comes to light pollution and its impacts on bird species. Because we haven't, the, the hard thing here though is that we haven't really been able to tease out noise and light pollution to the fact that we can say this is solely due to light pollution or this is solely due to noise pollution or you know this is solely due to impervious impervious surface. Like those things have not, especially noise and light have not been able to be teased out in that way to where we can really say that 
this bird's survival is, you know, impacted by light pollution or noise pollution. Like we can only go with, you know, what we know and what we see here. So although we found these significant, which these were significant in our models, impacts of light pollution on these bird species, that that is all to say that it still does not mean that it's solely light pollution. There could still be some mixed effects in there when it comes to noise or other effects. But light pollution was stronger, was the strongest um, factor uh, covariate in these models here. So going back to my point that I mentioned about light pollution and foraging and how it can actually benefit some species. Well, um, owls, for example. So we were talking about owls before in the chat about everybody seeing owls, which is amazing. Um, owls can actually, uh, to some benefit from light pollution. They don't need light pollution to, to forage and hunt because, I mean, it's just natural for them to hunt at night. But Light pollution does, you know, it, it is to their advantage to allow them to see their prey a little bit better than they would have without light, but it does not mean that they need it. Um, another thing is light pollution really um, drives in insects, right? So not a good thing for the insects, but a good thing for the animals who eat and rely on the insects. So, so it drives in, you know, a number of insects. So again, not good on the insects, but you know, good on the animals that rely on them. Uh, but I will say to this point that we're talking about owls, noise pollution, there have been some studies that have shown that noise pollution can have a severe impact on owls and their foraging because, you know, as you can imagine, owls also use their, you know, hearing a lot. Owls can hear really, really well. They, they, they use their hearing, you know, as they're foraging and hunting. So you can imagine um, as well, you know, with any other species, you know, who's not a bird that is foraging, you know, for, 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 um, you know, for prey that noise pollution would impact their hearing and then hearing that prey. So something there to keep in mind with that. What are some other results of urbanization on bird species? So there's a few. Uh, I'll start with predation. So do not get an urban ecologist talking about outdoor cats. <laughs> Um, bring out outdoor cats, bring up outdoor cats with an urban ecologist and they will go to town on why it is not right to have outdoor cats. And really they have a point and it has been proven, it has been shown that outdoor cats are one of the leading causes to, to bird survival and bird deaths, especially in urban areas. So if you have an outdoor cat or if you know somebody who has an outdoor cat, it's always worth having that conversation and saying in a nice way that, hey, your outdoor cat might be contributing to, you know, a little bit of a decline in the bird population. Um, so there is that. So we have urban areas. We have more people moving in there. We have more outdoor cats. And, you know, there I, I won't get into, you know, what, you know, people decide to do about outdoor cats and everything like that, because that's just a whole other topic in itself. But just know that, you know, predation um, effects of urbanization, predation, outdoor cats is my example that I like to use there, that can increase along with urbanization. Food supply, right? So other results of urbanization, their food supply. So that goes back to the study that we talked about, you know, with the sparrows, right? And they were seeing that the fat scores of the, the nestling sparrows in the um, urban area was really, really different from the nestlings in the rural area, right? And so the food supply in urban areas that becomes different because we see here, if you go in a forested area and you see all the bird species and the diverse bird species and other species that are there, that forest is made, you know, for those species to thrive with the resources that are there. You come to urban areas, again, you may have your generalist species that can adapt to that and they can adapt really, really well and go back and forth between urban and, you know, rural areas and environments. But you also have those species like red cockaded woodpeckers who need to stay in the environment that they're in. And if they even were to try to survive in an urban environment, it just would not happen. Species richness. So that goes hand in hand with the birds that you see, of course, in the forest. You're going to see a really, really diverse, you know, diverse bird species in these forested areas compared to these areas that are urban. You know, you may see a few, but there's going to be those species, those specialist species, again, that I like to call it, where you're really going to see them more in those forested areas than you would in urban areas. So your species richness in these urban areas can, can decline as well. So now you're probably thinking, okay, well, Lauren, I have lost all hope and you have given me all these reasons why light pollution is bad, but what can I do about it as an individual? Well, 
I will say, and I will give you some reassurance that rest assured these conversations are continuing to be had. Um, and especially, you know, I can talk about it from, from my standpoint of, you know, my research when it was published, I couldn't tell you how many different, you know, people from different cities reached out to us and they were like, Hey, what can we do in this city to, you know, reduce these lights or what kind of lights should we use? Or, you know, what, what can we do to make this area more, you know, bird friendly and like reduce the lights or turn off the lights. So people are, people care. People are reading the stuff that scientists and researchers and organizations are putting out and people really want to work for, you know, for a better world and better change, although it may not look like it in some points. They do. I promise. So when we're talking about common solutions on this broader scale, right, conservation efforts are informed with each new research finding. So not just with doing research on urban noise and light pollution, but with any species that scientists are researching, a research finding in some way, shape or form is contributing to that overall management and conservation efforts of those species. And it's the same way with birds. So on this bigger scale level, uh, Things such as noise reducing barriers have been installed in areas with heavy traffic. So if you're on a highway and you see those really, really tall, really tall barriers, those are noise, noise reducing barriers that has been installed to reduce heavy traffic. In some areas, environmental assessments are now mandatory before new homes are built or if there's new construction. When it comes to light pollution, we can do things like establishing protected dark zones. So these are really larger areas for wildlife um, that are, you know, they have these specific goals of, you know, how much light they're going to use, or if they're going to not use any light at all, that's specific to that, you know, bigger dark zone, large protected area. But on the flip side, when it comes to humans, um, it's less strain on the electric grid as well. So, you know, you have those that people can do on this bigger, larger scale. Overall, too, providing more green spaces. So this is just talking about urbanization just as a whole. There's many areas, and especially when we get into underserved communities, where you're going to see more sidewalks than you do trees. And because of that, you're not going to see as much animal diversity and, you know, and this plant diversity, you're just not going to see much diversity as you would if there were trees. So providing things like green spaces, urban parks, fields, recreational areas, that is what will contribute to seeing and showing that diversity um, of bird species. So um, there are areas, again, these underserved areas where they don't have that luxury, but I have been to some places where it was a goal for these people to establish a green space or establish a park where these individuals could go and could see native plants and could see birds and could see butterflies, everything like that. So just urbanization on a more bigger level, because again, all throughout this presentation, I was talking about the daunting, you know, the daunting impacts of urbanization. There are ways that we can get around that because, you know, of course, you know, we're people People, the world is growing. We need housing. We get it. But there is a way that we can incorporate things like green spaces to combat that and, you know, provide a space for wildlife and also provide a space for people to go and explore wildlife and be in the outdoors. So that was a more of a bigger scale. So let's talk about some simple practices that you can do as an individual. So these are my two favorites that I love to bring up because they're they're really simple and anyone I think can do it. Um, so the first one, turn off your lights. <laughs> Just plain and simple, turn off your lights. Um, this is a benefit for wildlife because wildlife live under natural conditions. Wildlife, they don't need lights. Um, it's just like with the owl example. Could they benefit from lights? Sure, but do they need them? No. <laughs> so this whole thing with, oh, animals need to see. I, wild, wildlife, they, they know what to do. So anytime that we can turn off our lights, it will benefit the wildlife because they live under natural conditions. That's just the way the world works. This can also benefit from humans because one, you get better sleep. So the whole thing with like, you know, the blue light on your phone or like turn down your brightness or anything like that. That's what we're talking about when it's, you know, better sleep, better on your eyesight um, and lower electric bills because who doesn't want a lower electric bill, right? So, you know, anytime that you can turn off your lights. It may sound simple. It may feel like, oh, like this isn't doing much. I promise it is. It may not seem like it, but I promise it is because you're doing your part to protect and conserve this environment for future generations. So just keep that in mind. Another solution is change your lights. So 
Keep in mind that red and yellow lights are less harmful. LED lights in particular reduce heat and carbon. So that's really important. Installing motion sensors. So this is something that a lot of people do. When you're going in your driveway, you have a light that comes on. Make sure it's a motion sensor so that it goes off, right? Um, this gets into the fact of, you know, on this larger scale of looking at illuminated billboards or buildings. There, I mean, I read articles all the time from people who, you know, have, you know, say that, oh, I talked to this company and they leave their building lights on all the time, but nobody's in there. Why are they on? Because then we get that, we get the impact of the bird window collisions and the huge one that we saw in Chicago, Illinois, right? So that's the result of that. So installing motion sensor lights, repairing outdoor fixtures to minimize glare is another one. And remember that your outdoor fixtures should be facing down. If possible, they should be facing downwards, not upwards, because again, this can contribute to that thing that I called sky glow. That's what it's called. But the thing that I mentioned called sky glow, that that can contribute to the sky. It can, and then for birds in particular, they use the sky, they use landmarks that use stars in that sky. And so just picture this increasing sky glow can impact that, right? So those are just some simple fixes that you can do as individuals. And again, I want to reiterate and stress that it may not seem like a lot, but I promise you that it is knowing that you're doing your part to protect and conserve this environment. And take any of the information that I that I spoke on today, take it to your neighbor, take it to your coworker, take it to your colleague. I mean, take it to whoever and inform them about ways that they can reduce, you know, their lights and talking about noise pollution and light pollution and urbanization as a whole, right? Just talk about those ways and talk about it with people. And we can continue on this path to success when it comes to reducing and turning off our lights. So the last thing that I want to touch on here is I want to put in a plug um, for my nonprofit. So I um, forgot to put this in my, well, I don't know if I forgot to put it in my bio or I just like reduced my bio and was like, yeah, like I won't mention this, but I actually found that it was really relevant for this presentation. So um Aside from the many other things that I have going on as a PhD student, my colleague and I co-founded a nonprofit called Field Inclusive. And so basically the mission of this nonprofit is to amplify and support marginalized and historically excluded individuals who professionally work outdoors. So these groups that we're talking about is anything from race to religion to disability to sexuality. Um, and really we saw that there was a need in our program considering that we have a portion of our degree where we have to do outdoor data collection and work outdoors, that there wasn't really a lot of support there for any student, but particularly marginalized and historically excluded individuals were put in that high risk category based on stereotypes and judgments and everything like that. And we noticed that there was not a lot of support there for that. And so we decided to establish this nonprofit in order to bring more awareness to organizations and build on that support. So that is our basis and our background for our mission. But we also do educational and informational programming. One of those programming is our Beginning Birders program. So this program is um, was started by Field Inclusive and our local Wake Audubon Society. And in this program, it's just like it sounds, Beginning Birders program. So we have people who come out who have never birded before, and we introduce them to, you know, to beginner birding tips. So anything from bird identification to um, common birds that they'll see in their backyards to, you know, it, like equipment and technology, binoculars, scopes, you name it. But the real important thing here is that it serves our nonprofit's mission because we're creating a space for these groups who we may not really see that much in the outdoors. And it's creating a space for them to learn something new within an environment that they are within their community. So, so far we've had people from Outdoor Afro, we've had people from our LGBTQ Center here in Raleigh. They've come out and they've benefited from this program so much because it provided them a space to learn something new for people who've never birded before, but to also have that space to be with their community and be and feel supported. So with this program though, the reason why I put it in is to also, um, is to also say that we are incorporating some talks when it comes to urbanization, because again, we're in Raleigh, where we host this, it's in the heart of, you know, Raleigh and the heart of an underserved community. Um, so we're dealing with those things like those urbanization effects and noise pollution and light pollution and everything like that. And so we're wanting, we're, we're working on incorporating a section in our program that 
um, talks about that and talks about, you know, the, the, the risk and what we can do as individuals and everything like that. So I did want to put this up here because, um, you know, I have, again, a QR code and a link um, if you are able and would like to support our mission and, and donate to this and, and donating, you will be donating to this program and helping, you know, us um, with our mission and talking about urban birds and, you know, this program as a whole. But um, again, if, if you have the means and you would like to, please feel free. But if not right now, it's totally fine. Again, I have it in that resource list that I will show at the end of the slide and you can come back to it whenever you are able. But also please feel free to visit Field Inclusive's website and internet stalk us and find out what we're, um, what we're all about there. Uh, so with that said, I really hope that you all learned something new today when it comes to not just light pollution, but noise pollution and urbanization as a whole, although I did focus a lot on light pollution because that's where my research, you know, dabbled in there. So it's what I could speak to the most. Um, but again, uh, if you go to this QR code here, it'll bring you to a resource page. Or if you type in that link, it'll bring you to a resource page that resources all of the um the the scientific articles and other resources from my colleagues and things like that if you do want to learn more about um light pollution and ways that you can help our our urban birds and our bird friends and so with that please feel free if you have any questions i feel like i have a little bit of time for questions um but feel free to email me if you have any questions that you can't think of tonight my website is there and also feel free to follow me on social media i do i'm not a professional bird photographer but i do take a lot of bird photos I I'm, when I'm out in the piney woods, I'll like have videos of myself out in the piney woods with doing my red cockaded woodpecker work. And like, it's a very, I, I do an educational platform. So you'll learn a lot it, um, if you would like to follow me there. But um, with that, I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank again, the Harris Center for having me. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and take some questions. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, excellent talk. And uh, your uh, your passion and knowledge for the topics that you presented on are really clear, and uh, and thanks for giving us some solutions as well. I really oh, liked how you were able to provide some things that we can do in our own backyards yes, and to conserve sure. birds. Um, so um, so I realize it's about six thirty now, but if those who uh, who want to stick around a few more minutes uh, want to hear some of the responses, we have a few great questions that came in. Uh, so let me just jump right into those here. Uh, I'll start with the one from Miles. Uh, are motion sensor lights good alternatives to outdoor lighting? Mm -hmm. Yep, 100%. so I think you, you did. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yep. Anywhere, anywhere that you can install motion sensor lights, that's 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 the best thing there. Or again, like I said, any time you can do red lights or yellow lights, um, you know, you can do that as well. So definitely, a hundred percent. Motion yes. lights are the way. <laughs> Great. Um, um, MF uh, noted that um, there's interest in starting some collision data collection projects on Massachusetts college campuses. Um, do you have any advice on data collection methods? I think specifically MF was interested in mm. um, using mm -hmm. iNaturalist as a way to document the collisions. Yes, data collisions. Yes. If you... Um... MF, if you want to reach out to me, I have a colleague who is actually here at NC State. He's also a PhD student. His nonprofit, which is linked in that resources page called City Bird, that's what he, his nonprofit is all based on bird and window collisions. He does surveys here at um, Meredith College at Chapel Hill. So he has this whole system set up for his surveys that I think will be really beneficial to you. So his, um, Again, his nonprofit is in that resource list, but if you want his direct contact info, please feel free to reach out to me and I can I can connect you with him. On that topic, do you know if eBird is another way to record deceased birds? Yes, you know, I've heard like too, too much about, I, I mean, I'm sure you can, but like I haven't really heard too, too much about the eBird world as far as recording deceased birds. Um, okay. It's it's all been for me, I've been around people who like have had like a direct link or a contact to say like, hey, if you find a dead bird, submit it here. So like, I've never personally used eBird for that, but um, that sounds like really, really interesting though. <laughs> like, so I don't, so I don't want to speak on it because I know, I don't really know too, too much about it. Again, I have like those direct contacts and I'm like, okay, I can contact this person if I find right. a deceased bird. But um, yeah, but that was really interesting to hear about, but I'm sure there, there's probably, there's a way to do everything now. Yeah. So I'm sure yeah, that's, on that kind I'm of sure. Scale. <laughs> 
on a large city scale, there must be a yes, a more, yes. Um, oh yeah, I see here. Yeah, there is a bird. Yeah, there's a project on iNaturalist called iNaturalist. Bird Window Collisions. That there you go. So iNat. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the way to go. iNat for sure. Okay. Um, Lindsay asks, are there any laws in place or proposed um, to help prevent migratory fatalities? And I know that topic came mm -hmm. up after that Chicago event this past mm -hmm. fall, mm -hmm. um, but maybe it's, you can speak more to it. Well, yeah, no, it's definitely it, it, the Chicago event. I, I can tell you what it was one of those events, that especially for birders. It was it was devastating to read about that and to hear that. And it it just backed up the point of why talking about light pollution and what we can do for it was extremely important. Um, I I have not since then followed up on like any new laws for that came out of that. I'm sure there's been conversations. I'm sure there's been conversations. I know there's been conversations, but I'm not sure if there have been any concrete laws put in place yet. Um, I do know, you know, even, you know, before that, but it just really reiterated the importance of those lights out campaigns um, that there are various, you know, cities and, you know, ver yeah, various cities within states that have this, you know, this, this lights out camp. So for example, Raleigh has one lights out Raleigh or lights out Wake County or, you know, like, so there's, there's those campaigns that are going on on that individual level that people are committing to. Um, so I'm just hoping that that can continue for sure. And that, you know, that, cause that's a big, that's a big way to help. And then hopefully we can get more, you know, broader and bigger with those laws. And especially when it came after the Chicago one. Yeah, that was, again, that was, that was tragic and devastating, but it reiterated again, why we need to talk about turning off our lights <laughs> and reducing yeah. that. Yeah. Your talk is really timely in that way because I yes. think that's really fresh. on yes. a lot of Well, no. And I was, at, this was, uh, it was perfect because I was putting it together and I was like, yep, that event happened. That would be great to add in there because it happened this year and it was very recent. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> great. Um, maybe this question or comment is a little bit out, outside of your, your area of expertise, sure. but in general, a um, uh, question came up from John about um, economic values to establishing green spaces. Maybe that's something that you touched on in your research in addition to some of the other benefits of establishing green spaces yeah, that, you know, anything that jumps out? Yeah, I specifically with this work, um, I was exposed to it a little bit, but it wasn't the, um, it wasn't a part of any, like of the targets that I was doing with my analysis, but I do know some people who like their research is right in the heart of that. So if you would like that, those, their contact information as well, I can, I can introduce you to them and they can really speak on that economic value really well. Um, I sure, just, maybe again, that's something we could put in the link after. Yeah, after for, sure, uh, for, sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, of course. And I just, again, I just, I do know for that simple fact that again, like I mentioned, when you get into areas um, especially areas that are, you know, underserved, you lose a lot of that green space. Um, I visited one in, in Virginia, um, and um, I, I gave a keynote at Elizabeth River Project. Um, they're they're in Virginia there, and their sole purpose for that green space in that park that they did was it was right across from an underserved community. And their sole purpose was, you know, this community does not have a lot of trees. They do not see a lot of native plants, a lot of, you know, bird species, butterflies, you name it. It's like the the area is like right near, you know, a a a you know a, a big, you know, body of water that's there and that there's a bridge and like people, you know, from those communities can go and, and see that. And it's just right across, you know, it's just right across from where they live. And it just establishes that importance of having those green spaces and implementing that. Um, but yes, like I said, though, if you do want more specifics on economic values, I do have some colleagues that um, have researched that as their sole research. So I can definitely put you in contact with them. Great. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Of course. Um, yeah, I'll just comment. I think that was it for the questions, but yeah. um, just reiterating, I think um, you're speaking to a group of bird loving people here, uh, people who um, want to provide some action yes. uh, to Im improve bird habitat, to improve bird health. Uh, so it's great to have the science to back some of these studies yes. uh, that, that really demonstrate what we can do yes. and uh, how we can create a, a greener space right in our own. Exactly. Community. Exactly. So, and again, uh, I just, I, I want to reiterate, it may not feel like a lot, but it's, it, it, it is if we all come together. So we're, we're working for the greater good for, for conserving conservation. Like that's, that's the key. Yeah. We're all doing our little part. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it's neat to connect with you across many communities apart. Yes. <laughs> 
we have the same sure. uh, we have the same passions and and um, battles to fight. So uh, yes. So yes. thank you so much for, for speaking to the Harris Center and of and course our level of education up a little bit more and yes uh, no of enthusiasm course enthusiasm for what to of do next. Of course, of course. I want to say again, thank you for having me, and I absolutely love your mission. Your group is fantastic. So. <laughs> Very, very energetic and welcoming, which helps so much. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. And thank awesome. you all for tuning in tonight. Um, we're going to be sending out an email uh, afterward with uh, just a quick uh, link or some links that Lauren will provide, some things yes. that we talked about here, uh, as well as uh, an evaluation. Um, uh, so just a little something you can, you can help uh, improve our programs uh, by filling that out. Uh, so thanks again for joining and stay tuned to future programs. Good night, everybody. Thank you all again. All. Thank you, Lauren. Of course. Thank you.